Good morning. I greet you in the name of Jesus Christ and welcome you to Algona First United Methodist Church. Today is our second Sunday in Advent, and this is a day to remember that Jesus Christ came to earth as Emmanuel. This is a day to remember that we are truly loved. So we're glad that you're worshiping with us, whether you are um, here in Algona or you are somewhere far away, whether it's during the week sometime, we'd ask that you would sign in, let us know that you are worshiping with us, tell us where you are. And again, even if it's later on in the week, that's perfectly okay. We want to know who you are and where you are because we are so happy to have you with us. Now today, again, as I said, it's the second Sunday in Advent. So I hope that you have, if you have been able to pick up an Advent kit, it, um, we've had Advent kits in the breezeway outside of our office, and there will be a few more that you can pick up this week if you have not. Inside the Advent kit is a, um, a little plate and a set of tea lights that you can light the Advent candles with us. If you are far away and you are not able to pick that up, I would invite you to find a candle in your house. Maybe you have your own Advent wreath and light the Advent candles with us. Today we are celebrating communion. If you um, were able, you're close, and you were able to pick up little communion cups, have those ready to go. We have these little disposable communion cups. If you are far away or you haven't had a chance to pick these up, then right now go gather your communion elements. A little bit of grape juice, a little, uh, a little bit of bread. Um, somebody this week told me they didn't have any grape juice, so they ended up with, I think they said another kind of juice, an apple juice juice or something and that's perfectly fine that's perfectly fine God is happy that we are together taking of the Lord's Supper and remembering the body and the blood of Christ and the sins that are forgiven and if you don't um, don't have any of those elements as Pastor Karen says then be blessed by the liturgy that we offer to you today now, if you do, you have been able to pick up a communion kit. In that communion kit is our call to worship, so find that. If you don't have the communion kit, um, the call to worship will be, I believe, I hope, up on our screen. And so I would ask that you um, say the bold part, and I will say the, the lightened part, and let's begin our worship together. The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof. For he hath founded it upon the seas. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? He hath clean hands and a pure heart. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord. This is the generation of them that seek him. Lift up your hearts, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting door, and the King of glory shall come in. Okay, we're going to try that again. Who is the king of glory? <laughs> the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Who is this king of glory? Yes, the Lord of hosts. He is the king. Of glory. Amen and amen. Well, I have a confession to make. Um, I've only preached a, a few sermons on sin, and, and it's because of this. Early in my ministry, after I'd only preached probably a handful of sermons, I thought I would, in my student post, my student ministry, I thought that I would preach this very prophetic sermon about sin. 
So I crafted what I thought was a very, very good sermon. I used the seven deadly sins and I weaved those into scripture and then I had examples and I had all kinds of, of ways that we sin and I ended with repent, all ye repent. Well, on the day that I delivered that sermon, a new person had come into our sanctuary of the, the small church that I was serving and was warmly welcomed by those who were worshiping together. And at sermon time, I had felt really confident about this sermon. I had worked on it. I was a theologian. I'd gone to seminary while well, I was still attending seminary. I thought I had this down. About five minutes into the sermon, I noticed this new person. This is a woman. She had tears in her eyes. She looked up at me with kind of a, a frown and, and not, you know, this not sure kind of look. And she stood up and quickly walked out of the sanctuary. At the end of the service, I went to others who had worshipped that day and, and I asked if they had known her. Do you know her? None of them did. They didn't know who she was. They didn't know where she came from. They'd never seen her before. But they did notice that she had walked out in tears. And I asked, was it my sermon? <laughs> well, this church was very kind to a fledgling pastor. <laughs> very, very kind to me. And lovingly, they told me my sermon was a bit harsh and a whole lot judgy. Uh, I felt so bad about it. And ever since, I've erred on the side of grace. And I've erred on the side of being a little more gentle, talking about sin, because it is very personal. It's incredibly personal. I'd much rather speak, and probably those who have heard me preach many times, I'd much rather speak about forgiveness and God's love, that abundant, great love that is all ours, all we have to do is open our arms. And yet, I admit, we all sin. We are all sinners. We sin big ones, little ones, what we perceive as harmless ones, and definitely we get judgy with people when they sin the, what we consider the big ones. The issue comes when as we humans call out perceived sin, from others, that, that sort of seeing the log in someone else's eye, we call those out but let our own sins, what we perceive maybe as little ones, well, we let those go. We can immediately see those sinful things and actions in other people and justify the actions within ourselves. What we forget, though, is that God does not weigh sin. Sin is sin whether we think they're little or big, according to God, sin is sin. We must understand then, or try to understand, what is sin? And we're working on, actually, through this book, Incarnation, it's by Adam Hamilton. He is a pastor in um, Leewood, Kansas, at the Church of the Resurrection. And by the way, I'll talk to you about how you can join us this afternoon in studying this book together uh, on Zoom. If you're a Zoomer, a Zoom person, I, there has to be other names for Zooming. But Adam Hamilton says this, and this is um, on page 52 of this book. He says, as we think about being saved from our sins, it might be helpful to first define sin. In both the Old and the New Testaments, the words most commonly translated as sin in Hebrew, hara, and in Greek, harmonisha, I may be pronouncing those wrong, may mean to stray from the path or to miss the mark. So for his definition, mean to stray from the path or to miss the mark. This implies that there is a right path, a mark, or an ideal that we're meant to follow as human beings, a path target or, or mark we routinely struggle to remain upon or to hit. According to this definition, we often step off the path that God has laid out for us, and that's sin. 
In Micah 6, 8 in the Old Testament, that passage lays out what the path looks like. This uh, Micah 6, 8 says, God has told you, O mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. So to stay on the path, one must practice justice, love in kindness, and walk humbly with God. For most of us, we can say it, pretty easy for these things to come out. Yes, I'm all for justice. Yes, I'm all for kindness. Yes, I'm all for being humble with God. However, that path can have lots and lots and lots of obstacles that pull us and push us off the path. Generally, most generally, Adam Hamilton reminds us that those are usually temptations. Temptations pull us away and um, cause us to have trouble or to cause others trouble. To stay on the path, we are reminded that we must rely on God even when we find we cannot help ourselves. I've been there, done things I know I shouldn't be doing, but I just couldn't help myself. It was either too much fun or it was something that I felt like I had to do. We've all been there. So Adam Hamilton reminds us that we're not alone. He reminds us of the Apostle Paul, the man who wrote much of the New Testament. In Romans 7, uh, the Apostle Paul says these words, I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good that I want, but the evil I do not want, I do. He goes on to say and call himself a wretched man. Who will rescue me from this body of death, he says. But thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Yeah. Thanks be to God, who rescues us from sin, and through the transformation of our hearts, sits us on the right path, continually wooing us and pushing us to walk, down that path of justice and kindness and humility. Well, now, as we think on that path and think on, on our own um, sinful ways of living, um, I call our praise team to come forward because song is one of the best ways to send that sin packing. Song is one of the ways that brings and draws our emotions closer to God and helps us to understand that we truly are loved by God. And I'm pretty excited because we're starting to sing some Christmas songs. So I hope that you'll enjoy this first song. It's called Emmanuel.
Let us pray. Holy and righteous God, before you, we can only admit our own unrighteousness and our world's deep brokenness. In gratitude, we praise you for giving your Son to be our Savior. In humility, we pray you will guide us now by your Spirit to live more fully and freely as your forgiven people. Amen. Thank you, praise choir. Now, I hope that you have your um, Advent candles ready to go. Um, I'm going to grab this little one over here. This is our little Advent kit. Um, today, we are lighting two candles. Now, don't forget, in these little tea lights, when you open them up, um, before you light them, you have to unscrew the bottom off, take out the little piece of paper that is over the battery, and put the battery back on, and you will have a little lighted purple candle. There are four little purple candles, and there are um, one little white candle, and so you should have two of your little candles lit and ready to go. As we light the second candle for Advent, we remember these words from Scripture. Do not be afraid. Look, I bring you good news, wonderful, joyous news for all people. Your Savior is born today in David's city. He is Christ the Lord. Whether we look out to the world around us or into our own hearts, we recognize our deep need for salvation. We light the second Advent candle to signify our longing for a rescuer, a helper, one who will deliver us from sin, from despair, and even from death. Jesus, you are our Savior. So let's light on our... Isn't our Advent wreath beautiful? I love it. Well, we have a handful of announcements today, but the first of those announcements is actually a video from our um, chairperson of missions. Her name is Jill Miller, and she's telling us about our December mission um, project. My name is Jill Miller, and I am part of the missions committee here at Algona First United Methodist Church. Um, I wanted to explain to you um, our December mission of the month. It is um, a nonprofit organization called Winding Roads. They are located out of Lone Rock. The um, 
The founders um, and directors are Tom or Todd, excuse me, and Jody Gifford, and they um, just felt this need that um, in the state of Iowa there's not enough um, housing for young men ages 18 and, and older um, who have aged out of the foster care system. <clears throat> And they, in their letter um, to those who would like to support them, they say they cannot do this alone. There is no government assistance since the children are 18 years old. We need support from others who want to see these youth become successful members of the community. Um, just some of the activities that they um, help them with include basic life skills, financial management, um, some educational assistance and social emotional learning, among other things as well. Um, their mission for Winding Roads is to provide support and guidance to young individuals and to recognize their personal potential um, and gain independence and achieve self-reliance. Um, we have a list here um, of some items that would help them to achieve their goal in assisting these young men. Um, just some um, examples include hygiene products, toothpaste, toothbrush, deodorant, um, cleaning supplies, and just miscellaneous items including socks, clothes, sheets, blankets, and food. Um, for the month of December, uh, we're going to have a box out by the church office and um, it'll, it'll say winding rows on it and you know if you'd like to um, donate any items um, please feel free to put it there and we'll have um, a list in the December newsletter from the church kind of explaining more of what they need so or um, if you so wish to give monetarily you can do so that way so um, and we just ask that you prayerfully consider this mission um, here this December thank you very much Thank you, Jill, for telling us about Winding Roads. It is such a, an important ministry that is locally and in our area in Lone Rock. So uh, several announcements for this week, in particular tonight on Zoom from 6 to 7.30. We will be studying together um, our Advent study. Um, tonight is our first night. This is the Adam Hamilton's incarnation. If you don't have the book, um, don't, don't have time to read during this busy time, or um, you just, uh, I'm just learning about it today, please, please join us. It, this is a video study, and so I do have the video, and you'll be able to watch that through Zoom. And you will, um, I just know, be blessed by the words and by what Adam Hamilton has to say, and then equally blessed by the conversation that we will have together around those words. So this Advent study will meet uh, each Sunday, the 6th of December, the 13th, and the 20th, from 6 to 7.30. That Zoom information will go out on email right after service. It actually was in the weekend Worship Plus as well. But if you um, don't receive our email and you would like to join us, you do not have to be in Algona, you do not have to be a member of our church to join us for the study, would you message me on Facebook and I'll send you that Zoom information so that you can join us tonight from 6 to 7.30. Now, other announcements, we do have hospitality meeting on Monday night, um, I believe at 5.30, and usually Chris Brown sets up a phone message or a phone conference for that. He'll send out that information. And then on Tuesday night at 5 o'clock, Staff Parish will be meeting on Zoom, as well as 6 o'clock missions will be meeting on Zoom. And that information will also go out again this week so that you can join them. It was also in the Weekend Worship Plus. Wednesday night at 6 o'clock, we continue, there's a group of us that continue to work our way through a book called Riding the Dragon. Now, each of these chapters are pretty much standalone chapters. So if you've not joined us so far, please do. We're, we're on chapter 6 in the book, but come and join us and be blessed by the conversation.
Every Tuesday, we send out our devotion. If you would like um, prayers or um, praises to be part of that devotion, Pastor Karen writes the devotion for us, and then the prayer list goes out on Tuesday on email. And if you're not part of our email address or part of our email um, um, in our email system, would you send your email to me or, or through um, through Facebook, you can message it to me and we will include you on our emails. So right now though, we have um, another anonymous piano player. Our anonymous piano player is has turned to Christmas music and actually it's not the Holly and the Ivy. I believe it's O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. So I hope that you will enjoy our anonymous piano player right now. Everybody's clapping in here. Yeah. Thank you, anonymous piano player. It's so beautiful. We hope that you play forever for us. Forever. <laughs> well, now is our time to offer our joys and our concerns. And um, I will ask you to continue to lift up the, the, those who are affected by the coronavirus. Um, we have, in Kasuth County, kind of hit a landmark, I guess you would say, not something we wanted to ever hit, and we've ended up being number one in the 99 counties in Iowa with a percentage, high percentage of positivity rate for the coronavirus. So God, please, gracious Lord, put a dome of protection around us and, and um, protect our most vulnerable Please, please lift up our care centers, our senior center. Lift up our children and our teachers and our staff and, and all those who work in the schools. I would ask that you would continue to lift up um, the leadership in this world and especially that of our country, that they follow your wisdom, gracious Lord. 
We ask that you will lift up our church committees and our staff as we continue online services, as we continue to um, be Zoomers on the committee meetings. I ask that you lift up Kyle Campy, who continues to undergo treatments for cancer. Please, please lift up Daryl Davis and his family as um, Daryl is um, making some changes and hospice is spending a little more time with them. Please lift up those who are waiting for tests and procedures and especially those who are um, going through um, rough times with um, corona, being in the hospital with cor the coronavirus. Lift up our military. This is a time when it's especially hard for our military families and for lift up our own um, specialist Johnny Studer and Staff Sergeant Andrew Johnson. Johnny Studer is the son of uh, Mandy and, and um, Big Daddy is what I call him, but Tracy, thank you. And um, also, um, Staff Sergeant Andrew Johnson is the son-in-law of Jean and Bob Kent. Then please lift up the family of Rethel Beisch. Rethel passed away this week. Her services will be on Tuesday morning. They are private family services through Lent's funeral home, but there is visitations from 4 to 6 on Monday night. However, with COVID restrictions, only so many are allowed in um, the, the funeral home at a time during the visitation. So please, please be aware of that. Also, I would lift up in praise and thanksgiving some news that I received from Pastor Karen yesterday. Her granddaughter, Cora Rick, um, or great-granddaughter, actually, she says, is the state champion in dance. And so um, she's a high school student, I believe, at Garrigan. And so we thank God and praise God for that and congratulate Cora and her family. And I know that there are many others who are in need of prayer. Um, I know there are many of you who are praising and the, the many blessings that are being offered during this time. And so if you would, if you would like those included in our prayer lists, would you send those by Facebook or call the office and they can be part of our um, Tuesday devotion and our prayer lists that go out to our church family and to those who are part of our, our email. Um, during this time, especially, I would ask that you pray for those who are homebound, um, not just those who are in the care center, but we have quite a few people who are just plain homebound. They just, because of the COVID restrictions, they just don't get out. Right now, though, I would ask that you would take a moment of silence and um, to feel God's presence, to offer those prayers that you personally have to offer to God. We'll then follow this with a pastoral prayer. Normally we pray the Lord's Prayer though. This time we're going to save that for during our time of communion. Let's take this moment in silence. O holy and gracious one, you stand on the path. You stand even if it's dark. You stand even if it's light. You stand on that path and remind us that through the busyness of our lives, especially of this season, that you expect us to be there with you, walking with you. And when we can't, you pull us to be on the path with you. We are prisoners of our own best intentions. We often clutter our lives with many other things, with things of the world, and things that might even darken our souls. But you standing on the path, you shine our way. You are our light. You calm our spirit. You lift our hearts. And as we have lifted many names today, many situations, you are that light of healing, that light of comforting love.
We pray that you light the way for those who need comfort and who need care and mercy. We pray that your light is there for those who are praising and those who are dancing and calling your name. We especially ask that you light the path of those who are living in places that are war-torn or famine-ridden or places that are devastated by disaster. We ask that you help us to be witnesses of your light, to walk into those dark places with you right beside us and be God with skin on. We thank you that you shine your light in our lives so that we may see the true spirit of this season, so that we may love and listen and care for ourselves and, and others. It is in Jesus' name that we pray these things. Amen. So I think I can safely say that even the greatest of us wrestle with temptation of sin at times. Even those that we put up on a pedestal, I really believe that they are just as tempted by sin as any of the rest of us. And we who are Christians, we pray in, that Lord, in the Lord's Prayer that we'll pray in a little bit, we pray these words, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For many of us find ourselves in the grip of sin. We seek help with a particular issue that is, that is a problem for us, whether it be an addiction or a habit that is not uh, sending us down the path of righteousness. Maybe it's an unhelpful way of thinking about the world or someone else. Whatever it is, many of us, we, um, when we find that we have these unhealthy ways of doing things, we seek um, self-help books. There are lots of them out there. Get on Amazon and just type in self-help. There are thousands of self-help books. Books that we can read that help us to, to um, look at our inner selves and try to determine what it is and where it is and why we do the things that we do. Maybe, maybe a person might seek a therapist. Someone who can listen to our issue and pull those little threads of, uh, of things that, that we don't even know that we're saying so that, so that we can be helped by this person to walk a better path, a healthier path. These, these ways of looking for um, a new direction, a better direction, a direction that is, that is healthy and whole, well, all of these things are, are really good, actually. And if I've said it a thousand, once, I've said it a thousand times, everybody needs a good therapist sometimes. Everybody does. Even the people who think that, yeah, I couldn't possibly go to therapy. Everybody needs a good therapist sometimes. Maybe I could even say everybody needs a good self-help book sometimes. To work on oneself, it's probably the hardest work you'll ever do. But it is the most rewarding work you will ever do. Having said all of this, I implore you, in and through and after this work, because I'm not against therapists and self-help books, I think they're pretty great, but even as you go through all of this, I ask that you seek scripture, that you seek God in it. Because the self-help book and the therapist, they can help you so far, but we need that foundation. We need the foundation of Jesus Christ, the foundation that the stories of Christ, the stories of Jesus and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the foundation of strength that can keep us not just for a season, but for our whole lives. Jesus walked this earth and, and spent most of his time in ministry with those who were considered sinful, those who were considered less than. It was said that Jesus spent time with sinners and tax collectors, 
He healed those who were considered the lowest of the low, and he loved those who were on the fringes of society and scoffed at those who believed they were the society. He washed people clean. He healed their ills. He renewed their lives. He forgave their sins and made them new again. If Jesus could do this for those ancient peoples, don't you think Jesus can do this for you? Hamilton, in this book, The Incarnation, he says this. He says, Christ redeems us, restores us, reconciles us, justifies us, and forgives us. I'll say that again. Christ redeems, restores, reconciles, justifies, and forgives. For Christ died for us so that we would understand the deep love God has for us. Yeah. Though I got to thinking the other day as I was writing this that these words are things that we don't normally say during Christmas time, during Advent. These are words that we might not say during Advent, but we might say during Lent. Maybe these are even Eastery kind of words that Jesus washed people clean and that we were, were to look within and we are to expect and we are to, to look at ourselves from the inside out. This is kind of Easter talk. It is kind of Lenten kind of talk. But isn't it true that without the sacrifice that Jesus made for us, we probably wouldn't be celebrating the birth of Christ? We would be lost in worshiping a baby forever rather than worshiping a God who saves us and who saved us. Jesus' birth and death are tied together, and without these, we would not be able to live as a people who serves a God who values us so very much that he would give his own son for, our, for us, for our sins. So no matter what has pushed you or pulled you off the path, no matter if you think this is really Easter talk and not Christmas talk, no matter what or how you have sinned or how you think you have sinned, Jesus finds value in you and he gave his life for you because you are the beloved. You are God's most valued creation. You are. You are loved. So now is our time to give of um, our tithes and our offerings. And the giving highlight for December is um, Christmas decorations. And you can see that we have lots of our beautiful Christmas decorations up here. But I will have to say, we do not have the great big huge tree that's over here. And I really miss that because my most fond memories of serving this church are watching, especially Ryan and Kellen, put up this huge Christmas tree that usually sits over here in the alcove. And so as you're giving today of your tithes and your offerings, on top of that, if you would like to give towards Christmas decorations and, and the and the. the the ways that we decorate our um, sanctuary and our church, please do. Remember the myth mission of the month is winding roads, and that is that, that home for young men who have aged out of the foster system and is located in Lone Rock. Right now, let's pray. And let's pray that, um, that God blesses what we have given. Let's pray together. O oh, gracious and holy one, we thank you for what you have given to us in the birth of your son, in his life, in his teaching, in his death, and especially in his resurrection. We pray that you will help us to give so that others will know the deep and abiding love that God has for us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And so now it's time, children, for you to come forward. Tell mom and dad to, to stand aside, grandma and grandpa to stand at the other side, and Pastor Karen has a beautiful Christmas message for you.
Well, it's the second Sunday of Advent. It's a long time till Christmas, isn't it? Advent, remember, that's getting ready for that great day called Christmas. This past week, you've been looking for the sights of Christmas. Remember my little angel? This week, I want you to think about all the taste of Christmas. Have you made Christmas cookies yet? We do that every year at our house. Uh, Remember, you roll out the dough, and then you take a, a little tin thing in the shape of a Christmas tree and stamp it down, and you put it on the pan and bake it in the oven, and then you get to put frosting all over it and sprinkles and chocolate and colored sugar. Have you ever done that? Oh, it's a wonderful thing to do to decorate Christmas cookies. I remember one year when one of my granddaughters, who was three years old, uh, after, we'd cu- after we'd frosted a lot of Christmas cookies and there was sprinkles all over the table, decided, she decided to crawl up in the middle of the table and sat there in all of the colored sugar and sprinkles. Cookies are a wonderful taste of Christmas. But a very special thing is the peppermint flavor of a candy cane. You have a candy cane at your house? Uh, this is, this is a, shaped like a cane, like the shepherds use, red and white stripes, to help remind us of that wonderful gift that, Jesus, that God gave us at Christmas. So this next week, Think about all the different tastes of Christmas and see how many you can find. Let us pray. Lord, the Bible says we are to taste and see that God is good. So as we think about the tastes of Christmas this week, let us taste the goodness of God. Amen. Our scripture readings come from Romans and Matthew, and again, Pastor Karen will share those with us. Our first passage for today comes from Paul's letter to the Romans, reading in chapter 7, verses 18 through 25. Paul is struggling with the fact that he is human, that he makes mistakes, that he doesn't always do what he wants to do. See if you resonate with him as you hear these words. Paul says, For I know that nothing good dwells within me, that is, in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. And so I find it to be a law that when I want to do what is good, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inmost self, but I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched one that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord, God's Word. Our second lesson comes from the Gospel of Matthew. 
chapter 1, beginning with verse 18, very familiar and beloved words. Now the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Pastor Karen, so much. Well, fellow sinners, Adam Hamilton reminded me of several things. First of all, I'm loved. You are loved. He reminded me of uh, uh, something from years ago, the Hellsberg Jewelers. They used to have those little buttons that say, I am loved. I remember as a teenager going to, um, as a young, young kid, going to Southridge Mall in Des Moines and going to the Hellsberg Jewelers and we would, friends would, dis, this is terrible, friends would distract the, the um, people working there and we would grab handfuls of those buttons and we would take them to school and pass them out to everyone. They said, I am loved. The second thing I was reminded of is my favorite Christmas hymn. We've not sung it this year. It's called um, Love Came Down, from, Came Down at Christmas. It was written by Christina Rossetti. She had a, a lot, a lot, a lot of health issues, some mental health issues, and yet um, she wrote beautiful hymns of hope. And another thing that I'm reminded of, though not part of Adam Hamilton's book, is that uh, a tradition that I started when my first little grandson was born On the day he was born, I whispered how much he was loved in his ear. And from every day that I see him or I am able to talk to him and now his little brother, Nolan, I tell them. It's a tradition. We start like this. Nana loves you. Papa loves you. Mama loves you. And Dada loves you. And we go through all the grandmas, other grandmas and grandpa. We go through the aunts and the uncles. We go through their kitties and we go through their dogs. And we end with, and Jesus loves you so much. And what's fun is that Bo has joined me in saying it to his little brother. You are loved. You are so very, very loved. I hope that this will remind you, as Adam Hamilton has reminded me. He writes, you are loved regardless of what anyone might, anyone else might say. You are loved regardless of how unloved you may feel at this particular moment. You are loved. It also reminds me of something that Adam Hamilton did not write, but that I noticed when I first came to Algona, First United Methodist Church, and that was during communion time. If Pastor Karen helped, uh, assisted in communion, it was a privilege to watch her offer the bread to children. You know what she says? As she gives bread to a a child, she says, she'll hold up the bread and she'll say, this means that God loves you. This means that Jesus loves you. And the first time I saw her do it, I actually think it was Grace Miller. And she handed the bread and Grace's little eyes and her face was all lit up because she knew that Jesus loved her. 
And not only that, she knew Pastor Karen loved her too. I'm going to, if it's okay with Pastor Karen, I'll probably never forget this and use this in my ministry going forward. You are loved. You are loved with a height and a depth and a width that you cannot even imagine. So whatever you believe you have done as a sinner, whatever you think you have, have done, even if you think what you've done cannot be undone, you are forgiven and you are loved. Know this during this Advent season, this time of waiting and expectation. And so now it's our time to offer communion to, um, to each other and, and to ourselves. And I would ask that you would now pray with me um, this prayer of confession. And you don't have the words, but if you would bow your heads. O merciful one, only because you call us and invite us are we able to come into your presence. We are awed by your majesty, humbled by your graciousness, and given to speak of our brokenness by your healing peace. You alone know the depth of our hurt, the pain of our guilt, and the tenacity to continue in ways which lead to more of the same. We place in your hands our tattered lives. Unsin us. Laser our guilt and open our ears to hear your word of liberation that our minds and hearts might come together in wholeness to live the new life which is ours. Through Jesus Christ, to the glory of the Father, and in the power of the Spirit. Amen. And that actual prayer came from Pastor Karen. Now, if you will find your communion elements, whether you have one of our little cups at home, or you have bread and juice at home, even if you had just um, have water and a few crackers, that will work. If you have not none of the elements, then please listen and be blessed. Oh, lift up your hearts and give thanks to God. For you, Lord, formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets, who looked for that day when justice shall roll, roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream, when nation shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war any more. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent in the fullness of time to be a light to the nations. For you scatter the proud in the imagination of their hearts and have mercy on those who fear you from generation to generation. You put down the mighty from their thrones and exalt those of low degree. You fill the hungry with good things and the rich you send away empty. Your Son came among us and served as a servant to be our Emmanuel, your presence with us. He humbled himself in obedience to your will and freely accepted death on a cross. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread and he gave thanks to you, and he broke it, giving it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you, and he gave it to the disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we pour ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. Now will you hold up your communion elements, please? 
Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts and in the breaking of this, this bread and the drinking of this wine, may we know the presence of the living Christ and be renewed as the body of Christ for the world, redeemed by Christ's blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. And now, with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now, will you take of the bread and the cup, and remember, you are loved. This means God loves you so much. Now let us pray together. O Holy One, as we have shared this holy food together, whether we are here in the sanctuary, sitting at home, or sometime during the week, we pray that you will bless us with this meal, that it will sustain us and nourish us and remind us even in the darkest of times that we are yours and we are loved. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. And now will the praise team, will you come? And our last um, Christmas song is called Born in Bethlehem. And if you will listen to the words, it definitely talks about the birth of Christ and the death of Christ and how these are tied together and how through them we are saved. Today the Holy Son of God is 
born in It's beautiful and wonderful, and I want to remind you that you truly are loved. The verses of this song, this, this hymn, this love came down at Christmas, love came down at Christmas, love all lovely, love divine, love was born at Christmas, star and angels gave the sign. Love shall be our token, love be yours and love be mine. Love to men, to God and all men, love for plea, gift, and sign. Go. Even if you are a sinner like I am, go with confidence and know that you truly are loved. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen and amen. Have a wonderful afternoon, everybody. Have a wonderful week. And we'll see you next week, 9 o'clock, ready for the third Sunday in Advent. Bye, everybody. <laughs>